biggest political party in Scotland is the SNP, biggest political party in Northern Ireland is the DUP, biggest party in Wales is Labour, and the biggest party in England, and therefore the United Kingdom, is the Conservatives. And these strains, these tectonic plates of our union, are, are really moving apart, and we've got to think about it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ruth Fisher. It's my very great pleasure to be welcome you to this event at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Um, now, our guests this afternoon, as you know, have very different hinterlands, but they've got a similar interest uh, in the mindsets which produce um, colonisation, empire and inter-country relationships in general. Gavin Esler is a familiar face, of course, and a familiar voice from his distinguished career at the BBC, and he's turned his attention to the much-debated future of the UK in its current form. How Britain Ends examines the re-emergence of the four UK nations as discrete entities, and it discusses the nature of English nationalism and the merits of federalism. Sadly, my role demands complete neutrality. <laughs> Samir Puri's canvas is somewhat broader as he traces the origin and history of world empires through the millennia, but also he focuses on the extent to which imperialism still shapes contemporary mindsets. The title of his book rather sums this up, The Great Imperial Hangover. Now an, now an academic, Samir had a stint with the British Civil Service, a career choice which he seems to have survived with considerable aplomb. Please welcome them both. <laughs> yeah. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen, in your various abodements. Um, I, want to, I want to start with a quote from, from Samir, and, and it, um, it's perhaps germane to what we're going to be talking about at more length. And, and he wrote, why was it later convincing to call India a British colony, but over time less convincing to call Scotland an English colony? Would you like to um, explain why you wrote that, Samir, before I let yeah. Gavin loose on you? <laughs> yeah, delighted to. And um, thank you very much for having me. Really pleased to be here. Um, I wrote that because you know, I'm of Indian origin. And I was raised with a whole bunch of stories at home that really I never heard anywhere outside of my home. I didn't hear them in school. I didn't really hear them in, in British society in general, which is, well, our forefathers were colonized. And we came through that experience. We moved to the UK. My parents moved here in the 70s. I was then born in the 80s. And that word colony was really part of the vocabulary of growing up. We're very conscious of it. And understandably so, not in a... A sort, of a, a sort of a hateful way, just an awareness of your roots. And, and I never heard that about the nations of the United Kingdom. And it did get me thinking when I was writing the book as to whether we have many modern states around the world, the UK being one of them, that are former empires in disguise. The way that they were pulled together was through dynastic union, through military conquest, through some form of subjugation, the, the tactics of which are now out of fashion but they've hardened in their sort of well-known outlines on the map, and that's where they are. The UK is not alone in that, but each nation that is, each state that's comprised of these sorts of cobbled together nations, they've come together through quite a unique way through the, through the age of empire, which is what allowed for these smaller units to become larger kingdoms, perhaps empires, and if they survived the end of empire in whatever shape or form, that's really what we're left with. And Ruth, that's why I, I wrote those words. Gavin, of course, Samir also makes the point that kingdoms and empires are two very different things. And when you wrote your book, um, I mean, Samir was talking about being proud to serve his country in the, in the Foreign Office, each to their own. Um, but he said the experience had, had uh, left me with lingering questions about identity, both my own and Britain's. And I kind of suspect that's the same with you, because, you know, you're a Scot who's uh, long since lived in London. You've, you've been in Belfast, you've been in Cardiff uh, for work-related reasons. So, I mean, what kind of mongrel do you feel? <laughs> I, hi, and I, I'm also very pleased to be at the World's Best Book Festival, and I'm really pleased to see a, a live audience. I wish I was there in person, but that will happen one day, I hope. Um, I, and I... I'm Scottish. Uh, I've also got Ulster roots, Ulster Protestant roots. Uh, I'm British and have been 
and I'm European and I'd never really bothered very much about it as I traveled around the world, but I, but I bothered about it a lot more recently because I think we've all been thinking about it in different ways. Um, and uh, I think the question of identity on the, in the United Kingdom is very interesting because the question of the colonizers in the UK is of course quite toxic now, but you have to ask yourself at what point who colonized whom? In 1603, it was a reverse takeover. The Scottish King became the King of England as well and renamed it the United Kingdom. Uh, but thereafter, England has grown and grown and grown out of proportion to the rest of the UK. It was always bigger, but it's now 84% of the UK. And London has grown immensely as part of England itself. So the question of where power lies and who colonizes whom is a very interesting one, especially since in 2015, for example, the biggest political party in Scotland is the SNP, biggest political party in Northern Ireland is the DUP, biggest party in Wales is Labour, and the biggest party in England, and therefore the United Kingdom, is the Conservatives. And these strains, these tectonic plates of our union are, are really moving apart, and we've got to think about it. But you also made the point, and, and, and it resonates with a lot of people um, on, on both sides of this border and, 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 and throughout the, the, the United Kingdom, you make the point that um, Europe, you, know, you, you feel European, um, you've always felt European, I feel European, and if one part of one strand of your identity gets removed and gets removed without your permission, then that obviously is a, a spark to unrest. Ruth, the, 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 the real kickoff for this book was 2019 at the Edinburgh International Book Festival when I had exactly that conversation with a number of friends, who some of whom had voted against independence in 2014, Scottish independence in 2014, and they said, one level of my identity is being taken away outside my control and I resent it, and if it's going to be the European identity, I'd rather keep that and lose the British identity. By the way, what does that mean anymore? So my book's a challenge to unionists, particularly in England, to say, if you believe in the United Kingdom, what is it? It used to be Protestantism, empire, as, as Samir rightly says, and war. Those were the three pillars most historians see in it. So what is it now? And is it worth saving? And then there's a challenge to nationalists as well. What does nationalism mean? How does it differ from patriotism? I think we could get into that. But also, how, what does independence mean in an in, in interdependent world? And clearly... Uh, we are interdependent, unless, unless we're North Korea, which is, I suppose, dependent on, on China in a way. But largely we are. So that's, that's the challenge, it seems to me. And one of the things that, that really upsets me about this is that the last place you look for thinking on this matter is Westminster. Um, I, I think the audience might have something to say about that in the, in the fullness of time. But, but meanwhile, Samir, one of the central points you make, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, is that how you regarded... Uh, empire and how you regard imperialism very much depends whether you are from the empire building nations or whether you're from the nations that were colonized and I mean you, you mentioned that also in relation to your own background so where do you see the imperial past Im impinging on, on things like foreign policy just now? Yeah that's a fascinating point just very quickly on the background point I'd certainly never say it's predetermined so you know, if your great grandparents or grandparents or parents were beneficiaries or directly involved in colonization or empire, that doesn't necessarily mean that in the 21st century you will be proud of it. But the chances are that you may have a predisposition to favorably view stories of imperial conquest. And maybe you view the more benign parts of it and you, your brain doesn't quite, you know, lock in with the, with the nastier parts. And I certainly, with my own background, my, I mentioned my, my heritage is Indian, but my parents were born in Kenya and Tanzania, and then I was born in the UK. So very much a story of imperial migration, very much driven by decolonization. Ruth, you, you quipped about me serving in the civil service, and I, I did. I worked in the foreign office for six years. It's because I like international affairs. I like, I like those issues. That's why. I was amazed that my predominantly white British, white English colleagues uh, in the service with me, fantastic people. They had been brought up with such a different series of stories to the ones I'd been brought up with. Uh, many of them had histories of uh, British military service, British foreign office service, really embedded in their family's histories. That's why they went, wanted to serve. It's not that we had disagreements. I noticed the base assumptions in this demographic were somewhat different to the ones I've been raised with. No catastrophe there, but to bring this to your point about the impact on, on British foreign policy, it's 
it's, it's all fair and well that we've got within our population, within the workspace, different interpretations, different connections to the imperial past. I think uh, there's a real danger in the United Kingdom with foreign policy of not being able to see the world through other people's eyes, and in particular, if those other people have histories in which they had been colonized, especially if the British had colonized them. I won't go into specific uh, examples now in any detail, but just to the audience, I'm sure, will be very aware of what's happening in Afghanistan right now. Of course, Afghanistan was a subject of British occupation in the 19th century and occupation by others. But also when we think about the future with China and India as being major trading powers, major economic powers, thinking about the rather mixed British imperial touch points with each of those countries, and then challenging ourselves in the United Kingdom to think about, well, are those rosy and sort of benign interpretations of our imperial role or our past imperial role, uh, are they convincing to others or would they seem to be total fabrications? And I increasingly suspect it's the latter. And that can really land you in a pickle when it comes to foreign policy. Well, well as, as you've, you've mentioned Afghanistan, uh, Gavin, very much on everybody's mind just now for all the obvious reasons. And, um, a, you know, a tragedy unfolding in real time. Um, but we have been, as have the Americans, been accused of a very specific kind of imperialism there, of, of cultural imper imperialism, of trying, as America did elsewhere and as we've done elsewhere, of trying to recreate countries with a, a major cultural hinterland of their own, recreate them in our own image, however inappropriate that is. Yeah, exactly. And particularly since 1991 or so in the fall of the Soviet Union, the idea that the end of history, the unipolar world, there's one way of doing it, liberal democracy will triumph everywhere. We've seen exactly the opposite. There's been a great deal of, of hubris about this. Uh, and and it, it's failed uh, because we haven't understood other cultures well enough. And I agree uh, uh, totally with Samir in terms of what we learn in history is something that we regurgitate. So, for example, we have got a prime minister who goes on and on about global Britain, but British influence in the world, as Lord Ricketts, former uh, you know, uh, senior security advisor, I'm sure Samir knows very well, recently pointed out that Britain's role in the world, because we're no longer in the European Union, means we have less influence within Europe, but we also have less influence with the United States. We just have less influence. And we've done that to ourselves, or at least uh, sections of the United Kingdom have, have done it. So we, we, we have this kind of, uh, I call it in the book, nostalgic pessimism, uh, which is that things were always better in the past. It's the blitz spirit and, and that everything was okay and fine. Uh, and we look back as if things uh, we're always better in the past if we can only live up to it. Take back control is a good example of that. Uh, why are we taking back anything? Why don't we move forward is uh, one of the questions I ask in the book. Why don't we think more clearly about what's wrong and what's right with us? Because there's so much that's right across the United Kingdom that we could capitalise on, which we ignore. I think, um, Samir, as you're talking to us from Singapore, which is, gives you, as I say, some kind of distance and, and a different perspective, there has been an obsession in the, in the debate, not least the, the Brexit debate. There's been a kind of obsession in, in the UK of this World War II spirit that, that, that Gavin has just mentioned there. And, and, it's, me and it's used uh, ubiquitously by people who, you know, who weren't even born within 30 years of the last war ending. Can you explain that phenomenon? Yeah, I, no, I think it's really appropriate to be joining, joining the audience from an ex-British colony, in fact, given the subject that we're talking about. It, it, as we know, and I, I'm saying this with all due respect to the fact we can't really travel at the moment, travel really does uh, broaden your mind with regards to where you're from, because you start to see where you're from uh, through other people's eyes and from a little bit of distance, it gives you some perspective. Um, I mean, World War II, uh, certainly with regards to Singapore, everything comes down to 1942 and the surrender to the Japanese, followed by three horrendous years of occupation. And that's an interesting uh, comparison because one of, the, uh, one of the trump cards for those people who draw a sort of nostalgic and benign view of the British Empire and its legacies is that, yes, it was an empire. Yes, it did things that we would not contemplate or countenance now, but it was certainly less worse than other empires. And that's always the argument with regards to the Nazis and with regards to, to the Jap imperial Japanese uh, nascent project. 
that the British and its allies and its empire fought so hard to crush. Our empire wasn't as bad as the others. That's actually one of the myths that I like to play with and deconstruct uh, in my book. But why has World War II uh, caught the sort of public imagination? I mean, it's still within living memory, only just. But I think it's, it's about the story. And this is something I think Gavin will appreciate, because ultimately, when we're talking about history, we're also talking about the stories that are the most captivating. Uh, and there are good stories, there are bad stories. Six years, 1939 to 45, with a beginning, middle and an end, uh, in which the British, uh, with, with their allies, fight back from the road to triumph is much easier to encapsulate in the mind than nearly five centuries of imperial dominance and existence between the court of Elizabeth I and John Dee and you know, the idea of a British empire to the handover of Hong Kong, if I can use that as a bookmark, or a bookend, sorry, in 1997. It's extraordinarily hard to bring those four or five centuries into some kind of coherent understanding that can be conveyed easily because ultimately, the only thing you can do with the British Empire is to break it down into different parts of the world, different phases and different legacies. And it's so mixed. Everything is so mixed. It's so complex. And certainly, as far as England is concerned, I, you know, we have a devolved education system to a point in the UK. We don't teach it. We don't teach anything about the British Empire. That's something maybe we want to talk about a bit later on. Well, well but that really is, that's, that's a disastrous start point, I think. I, I'm not sure that I entirely agree with that um, characterization of, of history lessons because I seem to remember, though admittedly that wasn't yesterday morning, but I seem to remember um, reading quite a lot and being taught quite a lot about the British Empire, quite often to the exclusion of, of more local history. Gavin? Yeah, well, yeah, but, but I mean, I, I, I remember, I, I was taught a lot of Scottish history. I grew up in Edinburgh, uh, but I was taught, for example, that the British ended the slave trade. We didn't talk much about the 200 years before that, when uh, some places, including, I'm afraid, Glasgow, where I was born, was uh, a beneficiary of the slave trade. And the, the other thing that really struck me when, when doing the research for, for the book is uh, just to uh, push on a point that Samir made. Uh, was this great quote from Cecil Rhodes over a hundred years ago, this uh, quote, great British imperialist whose statue uh, is a matter of considerable controversy because uh, people like Samir are trying to review history in the light of how those who were colonized as well as the colonizers view it. Rhodes, Rhodes said, uh, ask any man anywhere what he would rather be and 99% of them say he'd rather be an Englishman. Now, I don't know if in a Glasgow pub in the 1890s anybody would agree with that sentiment, um, or in a Dublin pub or anywhere else, but it, it, it shows a kind of narrowness for somebody who had, uh, you know, seen and conquered parts, parts of the world. And it is extraordinary that the prism of history is such that uh, we, we don't learn enough of, of, of the alternative views. And when we do, uh, as, as is happening now, People say, oh, they want to rewrite our history. Yeah, of course we do. History is quite uncomfortable. Um, it, it's very different from heritage. Heritage is all those statues of people, most of whom we don't even know who they are, uh, which are the subject of some controversy because we review it constantly. And we should, we're, we're reviewing it now, but perhaps not enough. Is there, is there a, uh, I'll, I'll ask you this in a minute as well, Samir, but I wonder, Gavin, if there's a generational thing here because um, the people who are... Uh, unhappy, for instance, with the, with the statues in, in, in Bristol and in, in Oxford and in various other places, um, tend to be students or of that generation. And the people who are anxious not to, quotes, rewrite history, end quotes, are people who um, are perhaps their grandparents. And, and the same thing is true of the debate about nationalism, because um, uh, in, a, in a British context, it, it tends to be an older generation that are nostalgic for uh, Britishness to use the, the phrase you... you yeah, you, I, 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 th I think that there's definitely something in that. There's definitely... I, I talk to a lot of students and that there are definitely changes and people who see, you know, if, if you go to any university class anywhere in the United Kingdom, you will see people who are of a background which is somewhere rooted in former British colonies. And those are the friends and mates of those who are white British, white English, white Scottish, whatever you think. And they are quite naturally looking at a slightly more complicated or complex view of history. And that is great. That is exactly uh, how, how, you know, that is exactly how we come to terms with the past. But one of the problems is if we have a kind of benighted view, uh, 
uh, of it, you know, the Blitz spirit, the Dunkirk spirit, which was, you know, uh, exactly as Samir says, of its time, very, very important and very, very important in solidifying this country in the 40s, 50s and beyond. But this is the 21st century. <coughs> and and uh, not to revisit, not to think about the wider parts of our history is a big mistake. I have a, a, an image in my head, Samir, um, of, of London. And London, as we know, is a hugely multicultural city. It's, 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 a, it's a vibrant international capital that's got people from all nationalities now uh, living and working there. And yet the image I have in my mind is of, of um, soldiers and policemen guarding a statue of Winston Churchill. Um, now, there were lots of things that are worthwhile guarding, you know, not least people's lives, but a statue of Winston Churchill doesn't seem to me the absolute priority in times of unrest. No, and uh, just pick up a few of those points. I mean, London is, I, mean, I was born in London, I was born in East London, actually, uh, a very traditional part of London uh, for migrant communities to first arrive. I think the Jewish community of London first arrived in, in East London before, I think, migrating to North London, which is where, where some of those concentrations are. And uh, I, mean, I grew up in, in Newham, which is a white minority borough. Uh, and it's really astonishing because when you're growing up as a, you know, someone whose background is not of, of the British Isles in a white minority borough, I remember being under 10 and sort of wondering where all the white people had gone. Because there was a, a, a version of Britain I was watching on telly, which wasn't my world in, 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 immediately around me. I think as a child, you just extrapolate your immediate environment and think that's the whole thing. Now, of course, when I went, got older, I went to places like York, I went to places like Salisbury, and then you're the only non-white person around for quite some way. But Gavin's absolutely right that the changing demographics of the UK are one of the biggest reasons as to why there'll be more appetite and more authenticity for engaging with the parts of history that have been perhaps uncomfortable and just, um, I guess, not that important to uh, some of the people who have been generally running and managing the messages. Not that they've ignored them, but uh, I, I felt that the way the British Empire was dismantled, this comes back to your point about Churchill, by the way, the sort of the 50s and the 60s, it was dismantled without a seismic moment of collapse, as the USSR experienced, as the Ottoman Empire experienced, as many others around uh, empires around the world experienced. That is one side of it. The other side, it, it was obviously a maritime colonial empire and trading empire, so there wasn't the territorial adjacency aside from uh, aside from Ireland really uh, and so this imperial collapse happened and the British public could be insulated from some of its immediate consequences aside from the massive migration from the Commonwealth yeah. uh, especially from the non-white Commonwealth. I want I want Gavin to look at um, in a way what Samir has been writing about and what you've been writing about because in a way there's a there's a piece of crossover here um, somebody on, on the radio doing the job you used to do the other day said, um, how would Americans look, you know, the American voter, how would the American voters consider what is happening abroad, um, both what they did in pulling out of Afghanistan and in the reaction of, of, of British people and Europeans to what they did? And the person who was a, you know, a distinguished American journalist said, well, actually, they don't care very much about what happens abroad. They care if, if, if their soldiers come home in boxes but they don't care about foreign policy in that way. Now, is that happening in Britain as well? Well, it, uh, to take your first point, it's certainly true in America. Uh, all politics is local. Here's Tip O'Neill, a famous speaker of the US House of Representatives about 30, 40 years ago. He used to say, all politics is local. So they care about people coming home in body bags. Of course they do. And it's true in Britain uh, uh, as well. But I think the difficulty, uh, the specific difficulty in Afghanistan is the one which is revealed uh, over the past, well, it was revealed by Theresa May, actually, who said, where is global Britain on the streets of Kabul? And the answer is nowhere, uh, because acting independently is very difficult. So who do we act with? Do we act alongside the United States? Well, we can do, but that is that so-called the special relationship is a special relationship, but America has dozens of special relationships around the world with Israel, with Mexico, with Canada, with Japan. So we're not that big a player anymore. And so the question, uh, one of the questions that, that I try to raise in the book is, what is the future of the United Kingdom? Should it stay, to, if it should stay together, what are we trying to do uh, in, as a world role? Where is the strategic vision? And simply to talk both 
uh, foreign policy of global Britain and domestically of leveling up is just talking in slogans. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have any, any particular meat. And I wonder which, at what point some of that will percolate through and become a real political issue. Well, I think, um, Samir, you said in the, in the book where you were talking about the legacy of imperialism and how it impacted on, on, on the way governments in particular acted, and you said that um, one of the reasons that, that, um, that um, Tony Blair went into Iraq on the coattails of the American invasion was because he was a party to that legacy. Is it, do you still feel that way? Absolutely, and I think one of the, the important things about how imperial legacies work, again, this is a real core part of my book, is some of it's physical in the sense there's physical remnants of empire. And I include myself in that, as in, you know, coming from India, a former colony, why did my family end up in Britain, shape of borders, all the rest of it. But with the Blair point, it's really the psychological legacies, uh, not only of Tony Blair, but also of the British state. Why is it? that the mission, if you choose to accept it, of sending Western soldiers to the other side of the world, to, uh, with Iraq, to, die, to, to depart one moment, the site of some of the oldest empires and civilizations that humanity has ever seen, and to Afghanistan, the site of former failed British occupations. Why in the 21st century did that seem like a good idea with this large mission of building a state that replicates and mirrors uh, Western models partly through a desire to spread peace and prosperity and have influence, but also as empire builders have always experienced through acts of vanity. There's no greater act of vanity than to try to replicate the system that you believe to be uh, one you have authorship over elsewhere. And so I think with Tony Blair, um, I think there was an, a tradition in, of British statecraft of being in these sorts of situations and taking this sort of aggrandized role and delivering a bizarre combination of military force and moral rationalization over what you're doing that he seemed to slip quite comfortably into. And that, I think, is one of the missing pieces. People talked about his messiah complex, but I think there are some psychological imperial inheritances also at play there. I wonder, though, Gavin, if there's a disconnect here between the kind of um, mindset that, that Samir's attributing to Tony Blair and the fact that, if you remember, and, and you will because you would be living in London at the time, uh, a million people were motivated to march against the invasion of Iraq, which suggests to me that there's a kind of divergence between uh, public opinion over these kind of adventures and, and successive British governments. Yeah, I think, I think that is definitely, definitely true. I think, uh, just to add a little bit to what Samir says, I think also uh, Tony Blair was told by the outgoing Clinton administration that he was very, very close to, that you cannot ever be too close to an American president. That was essentially the message. And the, so that when George W. Bush uh, became the American president, Tony Blair, because he's a very smart guy, tried to figure out how do, I, how do I play this? We are not political soulmates, so what do we do? And, and you're right, a million people marching or whatever the numbers were, many of them, you know, uh, uh, trying to stop a war, uh, they couldn't do it because we had tied ourselves to the United States. It's a, it's, it's, a it's a complicated issue, partly because Blair thought that by doing so, he would force uh, George W. Bush to go through the kind of multilateral route uh, through the United Nations. The problem then is that to, <laughs> having spent many years in Washington, multilateral means you get the Brits on board and you get them to, to join up and then you can say it's not just us. So it's a, it, it is, is quite a, it's a slightly more complicated question, I think. Okay, well, I'm going to bring you home now um, to your own book about, um, um, because it's, it's quite a pejorative title, this, ladies and gentlemen, How Britain Ends. Um, there doesn't seem to be any question mark there, but there are lots of question marks inside the book about uh, the way forward for Britain. And, and Gavin um, put some options before us. He said um, we could embrace the status quo, we could stay as we are and reinvent Britishness, or we could have a formal federalism, um, which he describes as the, the, the most rational, least disruptive. Um, and then he said, alternatively, Scotland goes for a more extreme form of independence than the 2014 version. Um, so do you still think that these are the only options? And why did you use the phrase a more extreme form of independence, said your neutral chairperson? <laughs> I love my neutral chairperson. Um, uh, 
Well, very simply, if you look at what was an offer in 2014, which was not the way it was described generally, I would say, in the London-based press, uh, it is a very, for, uh, a very mild form of independence if you accept uh, the same head of state and if you accept the same currency and the Bank of England and defence relationships. You could call it a kind of confederalism or federalism. I mean, wh what would be the difference between that and say Switzerland. I mean, there'd be some, there'd be some differences, including the lack of a, a written or codified constitution. So what would make it more extreme would be not accepting the same head of state, not accepting the Bank of England, not accepting the currency. That, that, that would be a possibility. And federalism, all I point out, and this is particularly for uh, English readers, is the United Kingdom has federalized by stealth. We've already devolved so much. We've got three parliaments working in Belfast, North, uh, uh, Scotland and Wales, which have got different powers, uh, but they've each got a fairer system of election than the uh, uh, Westminster system, which is out of the era of the horse and cart. And everything from the legal system is different in Scotland, as you know, I'm, t I'm teaching Scots exactly what we all know, the, the question of religion and so on is very different in Scotland. Uh, the health service is devolved. We've got four chief medical officers in the United Kingdom, not one, four. There's one in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, one in Wales. So we could build on that. But, uh, but I, I, also, I also quote um, uh, a very uh, well-informed uh, uh, Scottish writer on this uh, who says that the F word, federalism, is already history. And I believe that is Ruth, Ruth Wishart. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, yes, guilty as charged, um, but I did feel that we'd been round that course many times before, yeah. and and uh, and the, the problems that are, are the problems that there are with with that um, solution are, are haven't gone away. The, the asymmetric nature of a, of a federal Britain being one of them, because when you point out the the federal solutions in places like Germany and indeed in America, uh, there's not that same asymmetric imbalance of power. You're absolutely right, and that is the biggest problem. But there was in Germany, uh, and they abolished Prussia. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that England abolishes itself, but I am suggesting that different areas of England have different, uh, uh, clearly different interests, different political views as well. I'm not also suggesting the rise of Wessex, but I am suggesting there's an English question which is that England is 84% of the United Kingdom. London is hugely important within that. And uh, there is great resentment in various parts of England about the dominance of, of England and Westminster. Now, the, the, the current government uh, said it was going to do something about it. And as far as I can see, they used the phrase levelling up and they had an away day to Sunderland where one member of that government uh, tweeted, it's so good to be here in North England. Uh, a, phrase, uh, a description of the north of England that nobody uses. So uh, there, is, there is an English question about how to restore some kind of power to local government in England. And that will be true whether we reinvent the United Kingdom or whether Scotland leaves. And if Scotland leaves, the biggest shock will be to England, not to Scotland, because Scotland, uh, Scottish people have argued about this, as we know, we know Ruth, for, for years, years and years. But uh, people in England haven't really thought, what would happen if 32% of the landmass of the United Kingdom were to, in some way, uh, become independent? What would happen if there was an EU border between Carlisle and Dumfries? What would be the impact on England? Where would the, uh, all the nuclear missiles go from Faslane? And so on and so on and so on. There's plenty of, of things about the future of England which have not even been discussed. And one of them is, if Scotland were to leave the United Kingdom and to join the European Union, the European Union would stretch from County Kerry to Poland and from Spain to Greece and also uh, to you know, uh, Shetland. England, England and Wales possibly, would be reduced to all those problems that the Tudors faced, which is what do you do when you feel that you're kind of surrounded by people who are in some kind of alliance, but you're not part of it yourself. And that would be very destabilizing for England. And nobody really, in, seriously, in English politics of a unionist persuasion is discussing that. I wonder what a, an East London man um, with a, a, a slightly colonial heritage in his back pocket thinks of this proposition. Does it impinge on, on you at all, this debate that's been raging throughout the UK, Samir? What, about the breakup of the UK, you mean? Or... The constitutional debate. Because, well... <sighs> 
I think that the problem, I actually found out, I learned a lot from reading Gavin's book because, again, there's an enormous amount of things which are just taken as tribal wisdom, tribal knowledge in the UK, and no one really questions it uh, directly. With regards to what we what we lose out from not having a written constitution, I think it's just taken for granted that uh, tradition and a sort of a natural biting point is the way in which the United Kingdom has come to function. Uh, but, uh, you know, the durability of historical arrangements there really are uh, not to be taken for granted because of different circumstances that they, a certain set of historical arrangements find themselves in, they can actually become much, much less strong. And, and I also liked in, in Gavin's book, we, we'd obviously read quite a lot of the same books. I think we both read The Invention of Tradition. We by, did, great by, book. By Eric Hobsbawm. Well, that's a great book because it was re really useful when I was doing my own research because it really reminds you as to how recent some things that are advertised as being traditions and having been going on you know, uh, into, into the distant past of history are, and so much of Britain is actually Victorian in terms of uh, the heritage of, of what we've got, and or it's been filtered through the Victorians, and the durability of that into into the future, I think, is isn't really there. But you but mentioned you mentioned Samir um, all through the book about how empires come to come to grief one way or another, with a bang or with a whimper or the, or just evolution and disintegration. Um, do you, do you, would you apply that same law of, of um, natural selection, as it were, to kingdoms as well as, as empires? Well, um, again, it depends on the durability of the bond. And I think some of this depends, and I think the audience will, will certainly agree, on those people-to-people -people contacts. Because I certainly remember, I was in the civil service during the, the Scottish referendum 2014, we got, you know, understandably some quite strict instructions to not discuss the referendum with anyone who's not in the civil service because it was such a delicate thing. I felt, though, that the British state did take it quite seriously. Uh, I thought there are some parliamentarians like Rory Stewart and others who uh, were actually going out and trying to emphasise the importance of people-to-people -people connection uh, across, across you know, the Scotland-England border. But I'd certainly say, going back to your original point, Ruth, being from East London, Scotland feels really far away, and this is no, through That's no because it is, any, and it is. But no one talks about it really, and, and many people have just never been to Scotland. It's a funny thing, isn't it? That I've I've worked in different countries around the world where there's different regions that don't know each other very well, don't get along very well. Gavin will have done much more of this than me. Being in countries suffering civil wars and reporting on these or working on them, you understand how misunderstandings and xenophobias can build over time because the people-to-people -people contacts haven't really been encouraged. I'm amazed that there's a version of that in the UK, and I am a little bit alarmed because I think there's a lot of stereotyping when it comes to between the four nations. Well, what do you think of Scotland? What do you think of this? If you're sitting in East London, it might just be a series of TV-generated caricatures because you've just not got those experiences. I don't really know what to do about that other than to have, you know, better railways and nice holiday options. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I guess for culture, cultural output, uh, including fictional cultural output, to reflect the different complexions well, of the United Kingdom. Well, I have to say to you, Samir, I look forward to welcoming you to Scotland in person um, as, as an East London boy. Um, but I, I should just, as a friend, say, don't call it a region. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not referring to Scotland as a region, but, you know, the parts of the UK. Can, can, can I interject here? Absolutely. Just you, Ruth, um, which is, uh, you know, when we talk about the British Empire and bits of it leaving and so on, we tend to thought, talk about post-World War II. One of the things that is not taught in British schools, really, is what happened after World War I. I was really struck by this. After World War I, we were taught the Treaty of Versailles cut 13% off Germany. It was given away, it was really brutal, and that led to the rise of Nazis. We are, we are not told that the United Kingdom has then constituted, after World War I, lost 22% of its landmass because it was the 26 counties of Ireland, the Irish Republic. And what we get from David Frost, Lord Frost, who negotiated the Brexit agreement and has botched what's happened in Northern Ireland, he said, well, to, in a famous speech in Brussels, he said, you've got to realize that, that, that in Britain things just evolved. Now, it didn't just evolve that Ireland left the United Kingdom and the British Empire in 1921. That was really brutal. It, it, and it came after years of trying to sort out these problems through uh, Home Rule for Ireland, which didn't work. So 
the idea that we can muddle through, which is another kind of cliche of, of the British political system, just, I mean, it may happen, but muddling through is tends to be a destination as well as a strategy. And, and we are in a muddle now, it seems to me. And not to recognize the history that Samir is talking about and the wider history, even in Britain, uh, or the United Kingdom as it then was, it seems to me is a terrible mistake. Okay, well, we've got, we've got some questions which have come in um, here, and, and I want the audience, uh, the, the live and lively audience here, to uh, respond as well. But let me just take a, a, throw a couple of these questions at you. Gillian says, um, could Gavin and Samir, um, uh, if, if they were to shape the slogan, Global Britain, what foreign policy changes would they want to see? What's the right future for the UK as a player in international politics? So you first, Samir. I think Global Britain should include more on Europe. Uh, I think at the moment, understandably, it's trying, to, uh, it's trying to look through the Commonwealth and look to places like Singapore, which is all very sensible, especially given the way in which global economics are changing. Uh, but I think a refocusing on, on what it means to be in Europe forevermore, you're not, as, as Gavin says, you're not going to drift the UK away. You can't attach it to, to some tugboats and send it closer to America. So you've got to work out what to do with Europe. OK, Gavin? Yeah, I, you, you won't get any disagreement between us on that. That's certainly true. Uh, we, every time there has been a choice about what to do about Europe uh, in the past, in 1914, and 1939, most particularly, since we talked about that earlier, Britain recognised that the only way to have a world role, in that case an empire, was to be fully engaged in the problems of Europe, the difficulties of Europe. Now, Europe is a much more benign place now, but we have to be engaged with our closest, closest uh, friends uh, 26 miles away uh, from, from, from here in Kent, where I actually am now, uh, across to Calais. That is the absolutely priority. And we've got so much going for us in terms of our universities, of our, of our, our, our uh, clever, uh, you know, uh, clever students who want to go abroad under Erasmus schemes and other things, which we have withdrawn from. This is just silly. It's just self-defeating. We have got a great culture in the United Kingdom, which we export, and we export it really well in Europe. Get engaged. Uh, with Europe first, it seems to me. OK, well, we, we've got a slightly allied question here from somebody, I think, probably in the online audience. Um, uh, it's from Benjamin, and he says, can any political party in the UK win a general election without pretending that Britain remains a global power? Um, and he also says, and I promise you, he wrote this. Hello, Benjamin, not me. Is um, independent Scotland's only way to escape this myopia? Nothing to do with me. <laughs> Nothing to do with me, Benjamin. Gavin, uh, well, uh, let's, let's, let's stick with the first part. I mean, how important is, is this global Britain tag to, to winning elections? Uh, well, I think it, it would be seen as, as what it is, which is just a two-word slogan as opposed to the three-word slogan. Uh, I mean, it is a slogan. You've got to do it. You've got to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And the other thing is, I would, I would question one premise of this question. What does it mean to win an election in Britain? I mean, we have had both Tony Blair's government and the current government won, won an election at Westminster with 43 or so percent of the vote. They don't actually speak for the majority of the country. And that seems to me, that's one of the most obvious problems if you want to fix Britain. You've got to uh, recognise that we've also got different voting systems elsewhere in the UK, which are actually a lot more fair than the one that we have which elects parliaments in, in London. Samir? Well, I thought Jeremy Corbyn gave, uh, gave an interesting sort of experiment in not being particularly uh, stereotypically English patriotic with regards to, I guess, traditional bastions of, of British global influence, like the British military and all those sorts of uh, parts of history. And I think, you know, there was just a part of the electorate that it, it shut him off from, uh, who just wanted a series of messages that even the pretension of, of Britain playing a big global role, maybe not the slogan global Britain, but a Britain that wants to be at the centre of attention, at the set, inter, intervening for good or for ill, humanitarian interventions, whether it's in emergencies, whatever it is. I think uh, it, we're still some way away from a major politician being able to uh, present a credible electoral uh, ticket and, and, and calling for a more introverted Britain. I think that's not really, really going to happen in the immediate future. I suppose in a way, uh, Gavin, that, that plays into what you were saying, which is... Um, you know, I, I used a, a quote earlier on when we were talking from Dean Aitchison talking about um, Britain having lost an empire but not found a role. Is there a sense in which England has lost an identity and is still to find its new one? I think, I think the English question is at the heart of this. And I, I, that Dean Aitchison quote 
uh, going back to 1962, I think it was, former US Secretary of State. He was very interesting because he not only said the, Britain has lost an empire but not yet found a role, but he, but he then went on to say, essentially, uh, not playing a full part in Europe and with the Commonwealth being kind of interesting but not that important. So he went on to point out exactly what Samir and I have been saying, which is that uh, the necessity... Well, well, to back up a second, what has been fixed by Brexit? What has been fixed? Um, uh, and that was supposed to be to take back control. And it, it doesn't quite seem like that. So if you don't have a relationship, and a good one, and a relationship built on trust with your closest neighbours, and both in Germany and France, for example, there are real suspicions in particular of this, uh, of this government and its trustworthiness because of what's happening with the Northern Ireland Protocol and other matters. If you haven't got that relationship of trust, you haven't got a platform on which to become uh, the kind of country that we like to think of ourselves as, as a, as a bit of a beacon, as, some, as a country that other countries should follow. Well, in terms of our Westminster system, they don't. And they are the sense of, the sense in which we believe that somehow people look to Britain for leadership and things is evaporating, unfortunately, despite cultural importance of the English language, of our great filmmakers, of our great writers, our great musicians, and so on. And that is a real pity, and we, we need to do something about that. I'm so comforted that you're staying firmly on the fence over all of us. Um, I'm going to get a question from this live audience, but I just want to read one from Julie. I don't want an answer to it because it would take us longer than we've got left, but she says, to what extent have the effects of Brexit returned us to the 17th century, and did the reasons for Brexit boil down to peak because of the inadequacy of the government to influence EU policies? Discuss, but not here and not now. Let's have a question from the audience. Yes, somebody in the front row there. My question is this. How can the, the UK state possibly survive when Scotland, which is a country in its own right, is being treated like a poor relation that is being ignored. We didn't vote for Brexit. Brexit is being imposed on us, and yet we're being told we have to sit down and shut up. It is not tenable to expect there not to be another independent referendum in the life of this parliament. And if not, what is the, what is the constitutional alternative? I'm, I'm going to stop you there only because that's a speech rather than a question. Um, and I'm not going to... If not independence, what is, the, what is the next best alternative? Well, I think Gavin's plan B, as he was saying earlier, was, was, a, was a, a federal system, but I'm putting words in his mouth. Gavin. Um, yeah, well, uh, you know, I was offering the kind of alternatives that we should at least think about and discuss. But I agree with much of the premises of the, of, of the, question, of the question there, actually. It's not just Scotland. Northern Ireland uh, voted also uh, to remain in the United Kingdom. And Wales, according to all the, re all the research I have seen, although it voted to leave, if you factor out those people who have retired or moved from England to Wales, uh, who are essentially English, English people, Wales too would have voted to remain. So that is... Uh, but what, what I suggest in the book is that is a symptom not a cause of, of, of our current problems. It's just one of many things that's happened. And it was uh, uh, Brexit, it seems to me anyway, was the, was the wrong answer to some of the right questions. And the right questions are, why are things in this so-called United Kingdom not very united? Right, have, we more, have we more questions from this audience here? Yes, somebody up, up the back there, just about three rows from the back. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, just wonder, you mentioned uh, the Commonwealth a couple of times. Is that part of the hangover or is it of any use whatsoever? It's always a bit of a mystery to me whether it's, a, you know, relevant. Samir, what price the Commonwealth? You know, it was a mystery to me as well. Great question, by the way, uh, because I knew I was from the Commonwealth. I knew about the Commonwealth Games until... Uh, I spent uh, four months working in the Commonwealth Secretariat. This was for the Foreign Office, helping to... They were doing some work on countering violent extremism. Uh, but it was interesting more just to get a sense of what the Commonwealth is. And the Commonwealth is an entity a bit like the UN, 
that's got so many different subgroups and so many different networks, like the Commonwealth Institute for Universities and the Commonwealth groups of NGOs, that it's hard to encapsulate and tell a story as to what the Commonwealth actually is. It does quite a lot of good things around the world, by the way, in terms of youth schemes and educational scholarships. But I think the Commonwealth itself finds it a difficult chore to convey uh, what it's sort of delivering. What it does allow is uh, convening power. It's a useful way of getting, for example, uh, the 50 plus member states, getting all their ministers of education, for example, potentially in a conference together, potentially talking about issues. Does, uh, do, do, does, does Britain use the Commonwealth as well as it could? Probably not, because I think the associations are now pretty fusty. And just to round off this answer, uh, so much depends on transition after the demise, uh, uh, at the end of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Whenever that comes, you know, long may she live for the moment, but she will, of course, be giving up her job. Uh, and, and, and when that moment comes, I think many Commonwealth countries might question, like Barbados has actually, as to whether mm. of the 16 uh, that uh, the Queen is, uh, the monarch is the head of state, whether they necessarily want that. That might kick off debates in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, but across the 50 plus Commonwealth countries, which not all of which have the monarch as head of state, again, there might be a sense of, well, this Queen Elizabeth II, she personally embodied the link to World War II, to 1952, when she took the throne, to the height of empire. But now we've got a reset. Do we really want this organic link to the United Kingdom? And maybe we don't. So expect those debates around the world to kick off, I think. Well, I'm imagining, Gavin, that the Commonwealth's in much better shape now that Ian Botham is going to be the trade envoy to. <laughs> I certainly think so. And uh, I, I think the DUP leader is going to be a trade envoy to Cameroon. So it's all, all going uh, very well. But. Uh, I, I don't dissent from anything Samir said. I think uh, I, I would just say that I think the Queen did an amazing job in the 1950s in easing the pain of transition for some people from empire to commonwealth, and, and that's kind of it. Is it relevant now, though, as an entity? I, I think it's always good for, for North and South to talk. I think that is a, that is a good idea to, to talk to Malawi and Uganda and so on. But is it relevant? I don't think. I, I think if you if you went onto the streets of Edinburgh or London or Belfast or wherever and asked people, what does the Commonwealth mean to you? There would be not much to say. OK, are we any more questions from this audience? I've got some more from the online audience. OK, well, let's go to the online audience then. Um, somebody who just discreetly describes himself as LF I don't know, well, I know what that means in Glasgow, but I don't know what it means. So, um, <laughs> we're talking about what is taught in schools, says LF, but what is written about in the press or discussed in the media is very slanted towards the centre, and that's the power of Westminster in England. And how do smaller nations deal with that? Well, you're in a, you're in a very small nation state at the moment, um, um, Samir, but I imagine it controls its own press fairly rigidly. Oh, uh, very rigidly, and for good reason, because like a lot of uh, former colonies, it had a very difficult transition out of that experience to becoming a successful country. I'd probably say Singapore is one of the most successful ex-British colonies. I mean, it's, it's a bit of an unfair contest uh, because it's a city-state. Uh, but yeah, the, the message is controlled. But one of the really interesting things about Singapore is they've not dispensed with their British imperial legacy. So two years ago was the 200th anniversary of Sir Stamford Raffles, the colonial officer who set up Singapore. They didn't tear down the statues. Uh, they actually uh, did an art project. They sort of painted it to resemble the skyscraper behind it. So as an optical illusion, if you stood square on, it vanished. Just to provoke some okay, discussion I'm, I'm, about I'm going to the British. I'm going to stop you there only, be, only because that, that's a lovely story, but it's only because we're running swiftly out of time. Gavin, you were... Um, you know, an, a, an anchor man with the London-based BBC for a very long number of years. Did you feel that that was metrocentric? Uh, I think increasingly I did. I think a quote in the book at great length, this great poem, uh, The News Where You Are, which anybody in yes. Scotland is probably very familiar with. And I think, I think that should be handed out to everybody who works in London in journalism. But I, for me, the real, uh, one of the real problems, there is always going to be uh, how things look it depends upon where you sit, obviously. So that's part of it. But also, what other country in the world would allow such large sections of its media to be owned by people who are not resident for tax purposes? We have done that in the United Kingdom with some of our newspapers, the best-selling ones and so on. 
that is a very, very odd thing for us to have done. Can I just ask you again specifically about the BBC, which gets a very bad rap, as you know, in, in Scotland, uh, the, the Scottish version of it does, from a, from a whole section of, of um, the public, but not necessarily from the media. Now, when um, you were at the BBC, it was quite often accused of being too left-wing. Now, with several high-profile appointments, it's being accused of being in the pocket of the Conservative Party. Does that mean it's, it's OK? It's, or does that mean it's um, in transition? Uh, I, well, I don't know, but I do know there have been some very high-profile appointments of people who seem to be very close to this government. It's always been true that some of those have been there. It's always been true. Margaret Thatcher, as you well remember, took a very close interest in what the BBC was doing and indeed for a long time uh, refused to let um, uh, uh, the BBC transmit members of the credible members of the IRA or their supporters without having them voiced over by other people. So it's always been uh, difficult to be completely uh, insulated from what political parties do. And I also know, for instance, that Tony Blair's, I know exactly the people too, uh, in Tony Blair's government used to phone up people in the BBC newsroom and tell them that they got their running orders for the nine o'clock or 10 o'clock news all wrong, they should change it in Mr Blair's favour. So it's, it's not unusual, but this government has been, in my view, quite blatant about it. Well, I'm going to have to stop things there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry about this because I could personally have this discussion for a, a long uh, number of hours with both of these gentlemen. But uh, can I just say, both of these books are utterly fascinating in very different ways. And they're both available, not just in the festival bookshop on site here, but of course in the online book, bookshop. And that is book at edinburghbookfest.co.uk. Books at edinburghbookfest.co.uk. I want you to join me, please, in thanking both Samir Puri and Gavin Esler for a most entertaining hour. Thank you.